Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Are you sick of hearing dietary propaganda? Me too. And this week's guest has been wiping the floor with ridiculous government-mandated top-down nutrition recommendations for decades now. And she demonstrates that decreased health actually correlates with increased recommendations from the government. Thanks, Uncle Sam. So returning to the show this week, of course, is Nora Gutgaudis, an international best-selling author, acclaimed ketogenic and ancestrally-based nutrition specialist, and is certified in clinical nutrition and neurofeedback. Nora is the real deal, and I do believe that more people need to be listening to her and her message right now. But before we get there, Here's a review that really tickled me when it came in for my new audiobook and book, which you get for free with your sign up to our new Patreon channel, by the way. Uh, this review just came in through Amazon, where you can also get my new book. This one's from Trish. She rated it five out of five stars and says, I'm not usually into poetry, but I loved this book. I'm generally not a big fan of poetry, but I happened to run into this book and really enjoyed it. Some poems are sardonic and thought-provoking, particularly around American culture, while others are light, fun, and laugh-out-loud funny. Then there are touching love poems and pieces about losing everything in a fire. It's amazing how much meaning can be packed into such a small space through poetry. I so much enjoyed reading a few poems at night before lights out, and will miss this book. Heck, Maybe I'll read it again. Tris, thank you so much. This is one of my favorite reviews that, that I've read so far around this book. Uh, there are so many things that you said there that that uh, warms my heart. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, I can tell that you really read this book. And I tried to pack it with meaning. And so you can fly right through it and have fun with it if you want to. And just giggle or, or skip by the ones that are a little bit tougher. But if you really spend some time with some of these poems, you'll find that there's more meaning in it than less. The, the, the words can mean multiple things. And so I have a lot of fun with that. And also, if you haven't heard the audiobook yet, it's great fun. And I'm giving it away um, for almost nothing for a limited time. Just throw a few bucks into the tip jar over on our Patreon channel. Just go to patreon.com slash Abel James. That's a new spot where I can connect with you directly uh, as our community. We started up uh, a new Discord channel that hooks right in and you get instant access to that. So I've had a lot of fun with, with chatting with people uh, in video for the new coaching program that I just started all over the world, as well as through our new chat community. So there's a lot going on. Make sure that you visit us over at fatburningman.com to check it all out. But I really appreciate those of you who have gotten in touch about some of these new, uh, more artistic projects. Now more than ever, I think we can see the need for art. For me anyways, it helps me release some of the tension that has been built up by all of the horrible things happening around us in the external world, which to a large degree is outside of our control. But what we can do is say no. So protest songs are going to be a big part of what you're hearing from the channels coming out soon, as well as, uh, you know, some more laid back stuff like, at the end of this episode, if you want to hang on, I just recorded a uh, an improv piano piece, slightly hungover, I do admit, <laughs> and uh, it's just a little bit more of chill out music. I, I really find that music and art can pacify us and, and help us cope a little bit better and put us into a better energetic state. It can lift us up instead of bring us down if you're playing the right thing and listening to the right thing anyway. So uh, hang on to the end of this episode to hear some music and the, the episodes of this show coming soon. Make sure to check out uh, the various social media channels that <laughs> are definitely censored now. You can still find us some places, but boy, are we buried. So you can always find us through Fat Burning Man, Abel James. We're never going away. Just keep on digging. You'll get to us eventually. Um, now, one more thing. If you do want one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, I do have a couple of spots that, that are ready for coaching sessions. So whether you're a small business or an entrepreneur trying to transition online, Line I've mentored many people over the years, and I really appreciate doing that because to be a podcaster, musician, writer, whatever, you have to be an entrepreneur too, especially now. And I would argue that almost everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. So that's a big part of the coaching that I'm doing, as well as if you just want to know how to dial this in, reduce your body fat, 
or get stronger, faster, train for something, I'm here to help and so is my team and so is our community. So make sure to visit us over at fatburningman.com. And if you go to fatburningman.com slash tip jar, T-I-P-J-A-R, then you're going to find different ways where you can help support us and find coaching and join our various communities. We've got a lot going on, as as I've said. So once again, I really appreciate you clicking the like button, subscribing in all these various places, signing up for our new Patreon channel that's going to be less censored uh, and less shadow banned than the other platforms where it's really getting ugly out there. So if you're looking for truth, if you're looking for direct interaction uh, with me and, and the team and the community, then be sure to get in touch because we're here for you. That's why we're doing this and we really believe in what we do so uh okay i'm really excited about this show with nora because it's been a while since we've caught up and like i said there is so much wisdom in what she has to say in the way that she lives her life and all the experience i mean she she's literally lived with wild wolves (laughs) so anyway we're going to be talking on this episode about what to do about dietary propaganda how to eat and supplement for a robust immune system what Pottinger's cats tell us about diet and nutrition, Alzheimer's disease and how it's affecting her family life, how to maintain brain health and age gracefully, what we can learn from looking at our hunter-gathering ancestors, and tons more. Let's go hang out with Nora. All right, folks, returning to the show today is Nora Goodgaudis, an international best-selling author, ancestrally-based nutrition consultant, board certified clinical neural feedback specialist and the only person I know who spent an entire summer living with wild wolves. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, Nora. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's great to be here, Abel. And yeah, the, the wolves were the four legged variety, by the way, when <laughs> yeah. I was in the music business, it was two legged variety. There you go. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to say earlier, uh, my mom says, hi. You're, oh, hey, hi. You're one of our heroes. I, and uh, I mean that. You were one of the people who have been talking about something that wasn't really popular when you were first talking about it. When when paleo started picking up, it was all about lean meats. It was it was about canola oil, wasn't it? And some other yes. kind of wacky oh, stuff. Oh yeah, we won't name names there, but yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and you really started this message message that was more fat centric, nose to tail. The the stuff that the people who want the easy version aren't willing to do. The one who you know, the people who are trying to sell and market the easy version of all this stuff aren't willing to go there. So so let's just bring people up to speed because some people, it's been a few years, some people might not even know where you're coming from these days. Let's catch them right. up. Well, you know, where I'm coming from actually isn't too different from where, you know, from where it was a decade ago in terms of the core message. What's happened is that it has it has deepened, it has broadened, it has dimensionalized even more. Um, more and more evidence seems to be coming to the fore every day, um, supporting, you know, what it is that I'm promoting, and even all the popularity of, of fasting and everything else. Um, you know, I was discussing those mechanisms over a decade ago, yeah, more than a decade you were. ago. You know, and guess what? You can get all of the benefits of fasting without ever having to deprive yourself of 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 nutrition um and you know this is something that i'm increasingly concerned about actually because with all the fasting going on and people decide deciding that the best thing to do is not eat mm-hmm. i mean i don't have any qualms with intermittent or occasional fasting the problem is the benefits are intermittent and occasional right <laughs> right and you're also running the risk in an era where we have depleted soils and contaminants in our air, water, and food supply and all kinds of things of, of, of really running into nutritional deficiencies, really mm-hmm. not getting enough nutrition. And, um, and you know, that's, that's the thing. You know, people think that they're making up for their crappy diet on the couple days a week they decide not to eat or whatever. And really, long term, you may be drawing yourself into a vortex. You may not be able to uh, find your way out of very easily. Those chickens will come home to roost sooner or later. So, you know, it's hard to know exactly where to start with all of this. But, you know, like like so many people in the ancestral health genre, I was I was um, sort of gobsmacked when I started to think in terms of how did we evolve and what were the selective pressures that shaped our physiological makeup, our nutritional requirements, and things. And that seemed like such a logical starting place. But even, you know, 
but but that's just what it is for me. It's a starting place. It's not the whole enchilada. So when I found myself on the crest of a wave that became the paleo movement, I felt a little bit like the odd one out in a way because I said, well, yes, these principles are really the only rational starting place that we have. But you know, just because our ancestors did something or just because they something grew out of the ground and they could chew it up and swallow it and not drop dead doesn't mean that food was optimal for them yeah. any more than it might be optimal for us. How would we know? And, you know, where I went with that in part was were some of the basic principles in human longevity research. How do we how do we cross pollinate these concepts in a way to better optimize those ancestral principles? Um, for better optimized health, but also, you know, I wanted to also find ways of optimizing those principles for the uniquely challenging and toxic world that we live in today. And that's something else that seemed to get neglected by the, you know, the so-called paleo movement was just not really taking into account this is a very different world that we live in today than was the world of our prehistoric ancestors. They would have not even have begun to have fathomed what it is we have to put up with. Um, and, you know, they had a much more pristine environment. And, and so, and, you know, I got, I certainly, I was also early on influenced a lot by the work of Weston A. Price. And, you know, I'm sure your viewers are totally familiar with him. Uh, you may not know this. I'm actually on the board of the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation. Really? Now. Very Yes. Cool. The 67 year old organization not yes, the weston yes. a price foundation which yeah. is a whole different the yeah, distinction we won't go is so there. weird to me but okay <laughs> you know? i know well and and we're working on that actually there are a lot of big and really cool changes coming and we're doing indigenous huh. outreach now and all right this on. stuff so um i'm very much a part of revamping that organization in and bringing it into the light of the 21st century because we have to do it you yeah, know thank goodness and, you know they they've been curating now and and uh, serving as the repository of the work of not only the the entire work of Weston A. Price, our organization owns everything that he ever wrote, every picture he ever took, every letter, every paper, everything. Um, We also own the entire repository of the work of of Francis Pottinger, including Mm -hmm. we have all of the remains of all the Pottinger's cats in our storeroom. I've held them in my hands. It's like, oh. That's amazing, a, you know. Wow. It's so, so for cool. For people who aren't who don't know what Pottinger's cats are, I think that's a really important thing that I haven't heard mentioned actually in a while. It's one of those other little stories that's being lost. That catch people right. up on it's, that. Right. It's, it's one of the more important, you know, it, it's it's a very very compelling message, you know. There seems to be a, an important message in it for us. You know, uh, Francis Pottinger was, you know, as a doctor, he wanted to see uh, what the effects of um, increasingly processed foods, I guess, we're going to have on the health and you know well-being and longevity and, and all kinds of parameters uh, and uh, of living mammals. And he used cats for the for you know for the experiment. And one group of cats got a diet that was natural to cats, you know, raw meat and all that kind of a thing. Another group of cats, <coughs> excuse me, got cooked food, and another group of cats got a bunch of processed crap. Um, and, um, you know, the first generation had, there were, you know, certainly some minor health differences, uh, but throughout the course of, of his, uh, of the study, and I believe there were up to 10 generations of cats involved with each subsequent generation, you began to see a total deterioration in the animals that were getting, you know, the, the cooked food, but especially the processed food. And it was showing up increasingly in the progeny, not just in, uh, birth defects and skeletal abnormalities and organ, you know, malformations and things like that, but also all kinds of, you know, neuroticism, you know, um, just clearly, you know, uh, really serious neurological issues that were developing in the the subsequent generations. By the like, tenth life generation, lifelong permanent, right? Like yeah, right. Built into these these next generations. Built into them, yeah. And by the tenth generation, uh, the processed food, uh, you know, cats couldn't reproduce at all. But what was so interesting and and what is and what is more, uh, I guess, optimistic in all of this is that he found that if he took one of these heavily deteriorated, uh, you know, progeny of, of cats that had, you know, were eating nothing but processed crap and he restored the diet to that of a diet that is natural for a cat. Um, 
that it took it with it, you could bring the health of the species back within four generations. Wow. I didn't right? know that part. Yes. And that's the part that is, you know, so I mean, the first part is like a total buzzkill, right? Yeah. But the last part <laughs> is like, wow, I mean, we can actually do something about this. It isn't, yeah. you know, that we're all destined to, you know, be, you know, just, you know, like a deformed shell of what we evolved into, you know, yeah. before the end of the last ice age, that there, that there is every potential to, to take that back to take back the size of our brains, to take back, you know, um, our health and well-being. But we have to do it. And we can, certainly can't allow, or allow, we certainly can't rely upon, you know, uh, the mainstream health authorities and whatever else to lead us in that direction. Yeah. This has got to be grassroots, literally and figuratively. And there's know? a lot of money that has the opposite message, trying there to make schools all that. vegan. You can't even brown bag your food in. Right? Yeah, in the UK, right? And right now, and in France even, and France of all places, whatever, and Germany, this these things are happening. And a lot of that actually has to do with the interest. Well, I think it's, it's an unholy collusion, really, between the interests of transnational corporate interests, which I brought quite a bit of attention to in some recent talks I've given. Yeah. But also... Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Gary Fedke from Australia. A little bit. Uh, yeah. Um, he has an, a talk out there that, you know, you have to see to believe. And it, it's completely mind-blowing. And it even surprised me. Where the interests of basically a religious cult called this, well, I think of them that way anyway, the Seventh-day Adventists, mm -hmm. um, you know, have basically taken over the uh, interests of, uh, of the medical industry and the food industry and whatever else. And they, they have in an insidious way sort of seeped into uh, having a profound influence on government dietary guidelines and making sure that the you know, animal foods bad, plant diets good message um, you know, reaches things on a global scale. Ellen G. White, who was the uh, founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, she had this idea that animal source foods were bad, not based on any kind of evidence, uh, not based on any kind of scientific evidence or anything like that, but, but on what she claimed were visions. And it wasn't enough for her followers to, to follow those dictates, but what she preached um, uh, you know, to the extreme was what she called medical evangelism, yeah. that we had, that the message had to get out there. And honestly, at this point, uh, you know, the whole life medicine thing, whenever you see the life medicine moniker, whatever else, that's a seventh day Adventist church. That's their mm -hmm. influence on what, you know, mainstream medicine is recommending as, you know, um, you know, healthy, you know, healthy diet and lifestyle. And some of it, you know, it's insidious because some of the stuff it's like, yeah, don't drink, don't smoke, you know, exercise. Most of it is a healthy message. Yeah. And then they seep in and by the way, stay away from animal source foods. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, it, it's, it's taken over. And yes, there are some school systems now that are controlled by those interests that are not only uh, creating vegan, you know, that they've decided to institute vegan lunches in the lunchroom, but they are even banning the ability of kids to brown bag meat, you know, related, you know, animal source foods into the schools. Yeah. And that is, well, it's not only insane, it's genocide. Right. Right. There are nutrients so. that children, uh, that human beings require and children especially require that can really only be gotten from animal source foods. And we have always gotten from there. And one of the things that, that initially attracted me to your work specifically was because you've been working with brains for a very long time. And a lot of your, your nutritional work is, is around um, feeding and, and nurturing, growing brains especially, but, but keeping brains healthy as they age too. And a lot of people need to be reminded that the brain runs on fat is made up of fat and and isn't this thing that just you can eat like a cow and it's fine and you never have to worry about it it's it's a little more pernicious pernicious than that well it is and it, it's not just that the brain is made it's not just you know like fat we think of just a blob of fat but it's it's also the the architecture of our brains and the kinds of fats that make up our brains are truly unique in all of the animal kingdom and even among primates 
And you know, the, the, the two fatty acids most responsible for our unique human cognition, for instance, are the 20 and 22 carbon fatty acids, arachidonic acid and degaussexanoic acid, both of which are found exclusively within the human food supply or in the, from the human food supply exclusively from animal source foods. Can, you, know, you cannot get these things from plant-based foods. And our capacity to synthesize DHA from plant-based foods is pretty much non-existent. We cannot do it. If if you are not of, say, if, if you're of Northern European descent, Celtic descent, or native descent in any manner, shape, or form, you can't make those conversions from plant-based omega-3s at all into EPA. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, yeah, no, you can't make any, any, it, you can't make those conversions because you're missing the uh, desaturase enzyme, the first one actually in the entire sequence of events needed for that de- elongation to happen. The delta-6 desaturase, you, you don't make that enzyme, so you can't make those conversions. You have to get your omega-3s from the those preformed sources, that come from, you know, animals allowed to eat what's natural for them, you know, which is usually green forage and or wild caught or, you know, fish or whatever from cold waters. And so, um, and so, you know, that's, you know, that's part of it. If you have thyroid problems, if you have, you know, certain nutritional deficiencies, there are all kinds of things that can interfere with that elongation process. But say, for instance, nope, you're not from any of those ethnic backgrounds, uh, you're, you know, your, your health is perfect, etc. You're lucky to be able to convert maybe 6% of that alpha linolenic acid from, you know, walnuts or, you know, flax oil or chia oil or sachinichi oil or whatever it is, maybe 6% in EPA, EPA, you're not likely to make any DHA from that at all. And if DHA isn't in your diet, it isn't in your brain either. And, um, you know, the, you know in, a, in one study that was done, the brains of vegetarians had, um, you know, on average 31% less DHA than, the, than somebody eating the standard American diet. Vegans wow. had 58% less DHA. Oh my gosh. You know, that has, that has, tragic, I mean, cataclysmic really ramifications for your neurological health long-term, right? Yeah. But it's not just about those fats. It's also what comes with animal fat is also fat-soluble nutrients, right? Um, Certain ones that can only be gotten from animal source foods like vitamin A, true vitamin A, retinol, not beta carotene. They're not Mm -hmm. the same. Beta carotene is pro-vitamin A and again, only under optimal circumstances can take you know, 20 units of beta carotene to make a single unit of vitamin A, you know, in some cases. And children can't make that at all. And many people, especially if you have, you know, hepatic issues, you have thyroid issues, forget being able to do that at all. Uh, There's no possible way, even under the best of circumstances, to meet your vitamin A requirements um, with with beta carotene or any other carotenoid, astaxanthin, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, And, you know, here's part of the problem with this. Prior to World War II, the primary focus, focus of anti-infective therapy was vitamin A. And it is quite literally the single most important vitamin, even more than D3, for the functioning of your immune system and your ability to fend off things like viruses and whatever else. And they find that people, for instance, ex- in people exposed uh, to measles, the only ones in danger of any kind of uh, you know risk of mortality are the ones that that are deficient in vitamin A. If you have sufficient yeah. vitamin A, you're fine. It's just like a little flu bug; it comes and it goes, right? So our our capacity for fending off all the super bugs and all of the things that people, all the fear mongering going on around all kinds of you know you know plagues and pandemics and whatever else, you know. Rather than thinking about you know quarantining yourself and hiding under a rock with with a face mask on, you know think about shoring up your innate immunity. Our innate immunity is really rather extraordinary, and you combine that with with you know vitamin A works very well with zinc, which is by the way best available sources and most bioavailable sources are animal source foods. Zinc has to be ionized in your digestive tract by hydrochloric acid in order to be absorbed. Um, and if you're just eating a bunch of pumpkin seeds and expecting to get a bunch of zinc from that, good luck with that because 
there are going to be phytates in the pumpkin seeds that 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 bind the zinc anyway, and, and other minerals contained in it. Um, and uh, you're not going to be able to. Um, uh, you still need hydrochloric acid in order to ionize the zinc to make it bioavailable for us, right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. We human beings have a hydrochloric acid-based digestive system, not a fermentative one that is characteristic of those um, animals that are designed to eat a diet that is exclusively comprised of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. in other words, plants. We can eat plants, yeah, we're supposedly omnivores, but that concept doesn't imply in any way, shape, or form that plants are equally nourishing to us to animal source foods. It just means we can eat them. And I believe the magic in plants is not the vitamins and minerals in them because they're really poorly available to us. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the fermentative capacity to transform all that cellulose and whatever's locked up in that cellulose into in, in nutrients in any meaningful quantity for our best health and well being. What plants have, um, you know, that I think are their magic for us, and particularly in, in today's world versus maybe our prehistoric ancestors, you know, uh, maybe needed them less. And that's it's the phytochemicals in them. Many of the, you know, um, uh, maybe medicinally beneficial, you know, there are a lot of. Uh, health benefits that that are well documented is associated with a number of different phytochemicals and the broader the variety seemingly the healthier the healthier our immune function what is not terribly well known is that these phytochemicals are also present in animal source foods because the animals have consumed them as well and maybe concentrating them in ways that we can also benefit from but i believe the name of the game with respect to immune health is you know the health robustness and diversity of our gastrointestinal flora, right, our microbiome. And the best way to enhance that is through dietary diversity. And so, and not just diversity of plant foods, but diversity of animal source foods. Yeah, so you're and not going to get there with chicken breasts and steaks. Right, right, exactly. And, and that's just, there's way too much emphasis on that stuff. Hey, big, thick, juicy steak, mm -hmm. slab of bacon, you know. <laughs> I, I know, I know you like bacon though. Oh, it's yeah. delicious, but it's a condiment <laughs> it that makes veggies more palatable, that makes organ meats more oh. palatable, you know? So I'm a big fan of bacon, but you know, it's got to be the right stuff, right? Absolutely. From the right kinds of animals, right? And that's just it. There's a lot of bacon out there that's, that's, that's like bacon, garbage, bacon. you know, it's, it's laden with sugar and all kinds of preservatives. And it comes from pigs that have been fed God knows what in confinement and, you know, full of stress hormones and, whatever else and most bacon is is not particularly good for you but if you look so the one of the other fat soluble nutrients that is the darling of the nutritional industry is vitamin d3 richest natural source of d3 lard pork fat right from pastured pork right, in other words difference. from a pig that has been allowed to live in fresh air and sunshine not in enclosed confined conditions but out in fresh air and sunshine and able to eat a variety of natural foods and not a bunch of junk, you know, and, and grains or whatever else. And they actually produce huge amounts of D3. And so, yeah, whoever knew lard could be a health food, it can. But again, all this stuff sort of depends on where and how you're sourcing, you know, the, so, you know, the, the food that you, that you consume. One of the things I'm really fond of saying is that the health of the meat and fat you consume depends on the health of the animal that meat and fat came from, mm -hmm. right? And uh, whether that animal got what it needed in alignment with its evolutionary and genetic heritage, right? Right. Otherwise, you're dealing so, with eating Pottinger's cats, and we don't know what that does to us, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something yeah. like that, and mixing then, metaphors another, yeah. a little bit. But. Well, and another <laughs> one of my favorite questions is, and it was actually a, a, a title of a chapter in my first book, is what generation of Pottinger's cat are you? Yeah. Because we're all... We're seeing it play out. We are us. seeing it play out, you know? I mean, you walk into a great place to go look. I mean, it's, you know... It's like a human wildlife preserve, you know. You walk into like a, you know, a conventional grocery store, right? Just yep. the, I won't name names, but, you know, we all know what they are. And you take a look at the health of people walking around in that store, look at what they're putting on the conveyor belt and just pay attention. 
Yeah, pay Watch attention. them get out of their cars and into their cars too. That's revealing. If they can do it, you know, yeah. without a walker or, you know, something like that, an oxygen tank or, you know, whatever. I mean, the uh, according to the World Health Organization, um, the vast majority of everybody on the planet right now has, like 90% of the planet has at least one ailment with more than 50% having at least five. Wow. And that's globally, you know? Yeah. So, you know, we don't have... And we don't have the wiggle room that our prehistoric ancestors had. Yeah. We don't even have the wiggle room of our great grandparents, our grandparents, or even our parents for that matter. Mm -hmm. And, but, but here is sort of the rub and here's our Achilles heel as a species is the fact that we are, you know, as, as, as a creature that evolved in the wild, um, we're fundamentally wired for, what I refer to as tangible threats. You know, saber tooth cat jumps out from behind a bush, chases you around. That's pretty tangible, you know. Cantankerous woolly mammoth comes at you, you know, stampeding at you. That's pretty tangible. A warring tribe comes into your camp, or maybe there is a volcanic eruption or a major uh, season or climate change or even a famine. Those things are tangible to us and we are wired to know that that's something we need to pay attention to and we need to protect ourselves from in some way. But that we have this unfortunate sense of complacency in, in modern life because we're fairly insulated from the things that used to be the tangible threats that we had to put up with once upon a time. We're all living in comfortable 70, 72 degree climate controlled environments. I mean, I don't give a rat's ass if you live in Minnesota in February, winter ain't coming for you anymore, you know? And, uh, you know, we don't have to take more than one or two steps in any direction to grab a handful of something we call food and shove it in our faces. You know, we're protected from the elements and from things that used to like to eat us and wh whatever else. And so we have this false sense of complacency thinking we're, you know, I mean, I sometimes joke that, you know, we're like, we're like boiling frogs thinking we're sitting in a hot tub in Vegas. Yeah. You know, yeah. and gradually our, you know, what, what is taking us out, what is destroying our health and what is destroying the potential we have to survive as a species is almost entirely intangible to us. Most of what threatens us is invisible. You know, it's contaminants in our air, water, and food supply. It's nutrient-depleted soils. It's radiation contamination. It's EMF pollution. It's whatever else is raining down us <laughs> from the sky. And it's, it's, um, and it's GMOs. And it's, you know, the sociopathic ideations of transnational corporate interests, you know, utilizing the grand theater that is mainstream television to basically socially engineer us into thinking that, everything's hunky dory and all we have to do is listen to what they tell us to do and you know whatever else or watch dancing with the stars and you know and and numb yourself out with beer and cheesy doodles and everything's going to be cool yeah and <laughs> and that's just it we have to make a conscious effort to care about what we can't see and that's the tough part and that's you know I, look i'm all about shining the brightest flashlight in the darkest places that, you know, that has been kind of my MO from the time I was a little kid, which didn't ingratiate me necessarily to my family, <laughs> nor does it ingratiate me to the powers that be or anybody that, you know, wants to think certain things. And, but it's who I am. And I don't know how to not do that. You know, we all have to be, um, you know, willing to look at things that may provide us with answers that we may not want to hear. Yeah. And I'm not interested in telling people what they want to hear to improve my popularity ratings or my bank account. I'm really quite passionate about wanting to see, I, I, I've had it up to here with predatory marketing and, you know, even within a lot of these popular ancestrally related genres sure. and all kinds of things, I'm, I'm sick and tired of all of, you know, um, uh, of all of that and what I'm what gets me up in the morning is you know what got me up in the morning for more than 20 years in clinical practice was human suffering you know seeing people being unfairly taken advantage of um you know based on you know the political religious or you know corporate economic interests of others and left to be confused and 
um, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, facing all sorts of misinformation and disinformation to the point of cynicism. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I I just, I want to see people self-empowered. I want to see people have the information they need to know what they need to do to, you know, once you can, once you actually see something, it's hard to unsee it. Yeah. Right. And so I'm really, really passionate about helping people to see um, what they need to. And I try to help them connect some of the same dots I have so that they go, oh, my God, how did I never see that? Right. Yeah. And and I feel like that is, you know, my best strength in what I do is through a lot of unique dot connecting, they connect different concepts, ideas. Um, you know, fields and things that many people might not otherwise think to connect and show people how it all fits together. Like if I'm, if I'm thinking about a particular uh, dietary approach, it's not enough for there be, to be a few papers out extolling the virtues of that particular dietary approach. I want to look at human anatomy and physiology. I want to look at longevity research. You know, um, I want to look at all of the. I want to look at all of the things that can I can possibly converge from every direction to connect at the same place. Yeah. And if it if if it you know if there's one or two papers that say this, but it's not in alignment with our genetic makeup or a physiological or anatomical makeup or something like that, it it doesn't fly with me. If it's not something you know, that we would have, you know, consistently consumed as a species, you know, had, you know, access to or and most consistently consumed over close to three million years, you know, something that, you know, you know, just came on the scene a few hundred years ago to me is probably not something that everybody is going to require, you know, mm-hmm. or the absence of which is not going to constitute a deficiency. Um, so anyway, um, you know, so again, animal source foods are the th- are the thing that that characterize us really more than any other primate species. We developed a unique, a uniquely voracious appetite for animal fats. Um, you know, short- and it grew our brains. That grew it, our brains. It shortly wasn't the after vegan we, diet that did that, right? Shortly after we swung out of the trees and stood up on two legs and developed opposable thumbs and figured out how to start scavenging, there were huge climatic changes that 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 caused certain members of certain primate species to develop kind of, uh, you know, become a little bit intrepid and do something a little differently, and that has basically snowballed over the last you know, a couple, three million years into, well, at least up until about 10,000 years ago, into what we ultimately became. Um, And what a lot of people don't realize is that since we developed agriculture, uh, we actually um, have lost in the last 10,000 years close to 11% of our brain volume. We went from a diet that was close to 90% animal source foods and maybe a smattering of plant foods here and there to now flip-flopping this into relying on a limited number of crops, you know, and you have to understand in the wild, we would have had a much broader diversity of phytochemicals available to us through, through different plant foods during different seasons. And we went from that to relatively, you know, narrow scope of, of plant-based foods. And we also, um, you know, began consuming them in a way that displaced, um, you know, the uh, the animal source foods that actually forged us in the first place. There aren't a ton of people just chowing down on liver. Not a ton, and there should be a way more. Yeah. I mean, I'm here to tell you that when I do the math on this, the ultimate superfood on the planet, hands down, is liver. There's you don't nothing. need much, and it gives you, you a don't. whole lot of stuff. Richest natural source of vitamin A on the planet. Also, one of the richest natural sources of heme iron, which is a human, which is a human primate species. We are uniquely adapted to requiring, you know, to build our blood. Mm-hmm. You know, the iron in animal source foods, the heme iron present in animal source foods, is very different from the iron in, say, spinach, which is poorly available anyway. Yeah, and it, in it, it's it's much less toxic to us, and we make much better use of it. I mean. I, I've seen people turn their anemia around in a couple of days just eating you know, a few servings of liver. Yeah. 
but there's actually a lot of people don't realize there's four times more vitamin C in a hundred grams of liver than there is in an entire apple. Yeah. Right. I mean, liver has everything. I'm not saying you can live on entirely liver and nothing else. What I'm saying is that when I talk about animal source foods, I'm talking about you know, the whole nose to tail shtick. I'm talking about all the organs and tissues, mm -hmm. but liver and heart and things like that have always been among the most coveted animal source foods. Our prehistoric ancestors consumed them preferentially. Um, some, some of what we think of as meat was stuff that many uh, indigenous tribes fed to their dogs, yeah. you know, right? Yeah, the muscle meats. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with eating a good juicy steak. I'm saying, we need variety in animal source foods just as we do plant foods. And the more yeah. you do that, the less vulnerable you are to things like immune reactivity to foods, mm -hmm. right? Dietary diversity helps to offset that by increasing the, di the diversity of your microbiome. Yeah. And, um, you know, and there are fermentable fibers in meat just as there are in plants. And, um, you know, so you don't have to eat plant. It's, it's interesting that, of the three major macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, the only one for which there is no scientifically established human dietary requirement is carbohydrates. Yep. You know, we can get everything we need quite literally from a from a wide variety of carefully sourced animal source foods, and um, we can meet all of our requirements in a way that is completely impossible on an exclusively plant based diet. Even if and, you have GMO bleeding fake meat burgers? <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Bill Gates, for that. And that's yeah. the other thing. We need to consider what the financial interests are behind what is driving current vegan propaganda. It's getting creepy. They have so much money right now, so much oomph behind them. The guy who made Titanic and Avatar just like right. throwing out these and Cameron, ridiculous right? documentaries. Well, and he, and he, owns, an, you know, he owns a financial interest in, in, in all of that, too. I'm sure, and so, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have to consider where, where the money is coming from. Look, there's no basis for vegetarianism and especially veganism anywhere in the human fossil record, anywhere in our genetic heritage. It doesn't exist. Even in the, even in the non-human primates that we evolved from most closely, none of them were vegetarian or vegan. All of them ate um, some amount of animal source foods that they hunted and killed themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, up to twenty percent of the diet of a chimp is is meat, but you know they also have a gut that is roughly fifty two percent fermentatively based. So they're far better suited to a diet that is higher in you know fibrous vegetables and you know greens and and you know fruit and stuff like that because they have the bacteria in their gut that can then take all that stuff and transform it into much more nutritionally complex and um, viable in a source of nutrition for them. But even a chimp doesn't get more than 30% of its calories from carbohydrates, even though they're eating mostly carbohydrates. They actually, and, and in fact, even a cow gets, doesn't, uh, even a cow gets 70% of its calories, not from carbohydrates, which it eats all day long, but from short chain fatty acids from the bacterial fermentation of all the fiber they eat all day long. Mm -hmm. Now we humans, our, the fermentative portion of our digestive tract makes up only about 20% of it. And so whatever the internal wildlife are doing in there to synthesize things is mostly slated for them, not really for us. We, yeah, they produce some, some, you know, butyrate, some short chain fatty acids, but we, those can't do much to energize us. It's mainly for the health of the colon and for the internal wildlife there, not really for the rest of us. We're designed to get all of the nutrients um, that we require, which is a much more sophisticated complement of nutrients, much more diverse complement of fats um, and fat-soluble nutrients from basically herbivorous animals that have painstakingly synthesized them for us. And so for us, it's a hydrochloric acid-based digestive system that isn't just necessary to break down the complete protein, which we do require, but also that hydrochloric acid is also necessary for the health of the rest of our digestive process and helps that pH signaling helps to signal the rest of our digestive process. It is absolutely necessary for, you know, say, cleaving B12 from its protein matrix and, you know, and then... Um, 
you know, so that we can then use intrinsic factor to digest, uh, to absorb it further down our digestive tract. It's absolutely required to absorb, um, you know, most of the minerals in your diet as well. We have to be producing hydrochloric acid. So if you're eating a plant-based protein that's already in its peptide format, where hydrochloric acid isn't required for its absorption, well, what are you really doing in that equation? What you're doing is you're you're preventing the production of something that you need it to actually absorb the minerals that are in that food. And you're also setting up some really dysfunctional signaling that is going to ultimately result, you know, long-term in digestive issues. You're setting yourself up for biliary problems, you know, gallbladder issues. You know, you're setting yourself up for, um, you know, potential overgrowth of bacteria and, and also inviting other, you know, pathogens and parasites into the equation. I mean, hydrochloric acid is our first defense against foodborne pathogens, parasites, and, you know, illness. Um, and, um, and so, you know, if you look at the stable isotopic evidence that has been um, generated through now decades of research through the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, where they took human bone collagen samples from various periods throughout our evolutionary history and analyze them for the determining where were we getting and what, what were we eating? You know, what was in there? What was dominating our diet? What shocked even me about that disco those discoveries, and it's been consistent throughout all periods of our evolutionary history, is that not only were we, you know, effectively carnivores, where there was really no evidence of plant protein in there at all, but we were higher level carnivores than bears, wolves, foxes, and other predators we, you know, we co-evolved with. And so, and I, and I think my, my take on this is how we got that way was that we had a sophisticated enough brain and the capacity because of that to develop sophisticated technologies that allowed us to successfully hunt these mega herbivores, right? Mm -hmm. That we call megafauna. And we shared the planet with more than 120 species more, well, 240 species plus megafauna throughout the vast majority of our evolutionary history, half of which the biggest ones and the ones that we most preferentially hunted died off, um, you know, about, 11 to 13,000 years ago at the end of the, what we call the end of the last ice age, mm -hmm. we're still in it. We're just in a period of glacial retreat as opposed to glacial advance. But, um, but, um, and at, when they all died off and it was a bottleneck, it was something that occurred actually rather, rather suddenly. Yeah. And when yeah. you see the, you know, the, the extinction uh, curve on that, it's just like a huge spike during that narrow period. It wasn't us that killed them all off. Right. It was right. a cat cataclysmic thing. And, and it killed off a bunch of us too. You know, I mean, the Clovis culture disappeared at the, t the same time and all mm -hmm. of those things. Um, and, um, but what we were left with was much leaner, much smaller, much more fleet of foot, much more difficult to catch. We still were very focused on fat as a preferential thing to go after. It just became harder to get it, right? Yep. And this was something that I really took away. Um, this was something that really stood out to me from Weston Price's work. To kind of dovetail back to that again, because look, he spent more than a decade traveling over 100,000 miles around the planet, looking at dozens of indigenous and traditional cultures that were still doing things the old way. I really envy the guy. I mean, it was such that a narrow so window of cool. opportunity, oh wasn't it? Man, you know, it was, we had just developed air travel, but still all these cultures were thriving. And so there was that narrow window of opportunity that could never existed before that or after that. And he went in and he got in, you know, and, and he studied, you know, the health and the diets of all of these different societies. And he also looked at what was happening to people that were, you know, enculturating and, you know, modern going into, you know, modern modernization and whatever, and moving into modern uh, societies and what was happening to them and their kids. But, um, but obviously the, what he, what he determined was that those people that were living closest to what their ancestors had done for millennia 
were just extraordinarily healthy and robust and you know, um, just free of the diseases and the skeletal abnormalities and birth defects and, you know, dental problems and everything else of, of that characterize modern day society. So what a lot of people, and even those claiming, some of those claiming to represent his work, um, you know, took away from that is sort of this notion of just eat real food, right? Just because, you know, the diets of a lot of these different cultures, the diets of the Aboriginals in the out, in the outback of Australia were going to be very different from that of the Inuit right. or very different from those in the jungles of South America or Africa or, you know, whatever. So because of the eco-diversity, it was thought that, well, just eat real food and that's all there is to it. But he was a pretty smart guy and he asked himself the question, that um, that I'm very glad that he asked. He he asked himself, "What did all of the healthiest people I studied? What were the dietary inclusions? You know, um, there were dietary principles that they all had in common, and there were a couple things that came up. One of which was, in all of the healthiest people groups that he studied, that were the most free from physical and mental disease, um, none of them." were anywhere even close to vegetarian or vegan. They all ate as many animal source foods as were available to them. He looked really hard for vegan culture, you know, out there somewhere. He thought he'd find one. He couldn't find one anywhere. There was just zero example of that. And it disappointed him. But he did find that the more animal source, the more variety of animal source foods that were available to a particular culture, the better they did. But, but in addition to that, the most important food the most venerated food, the most sought after food in every one of these people groups that had the most robust health were those foods that were highest in fat, mainly animal fat and fat soluble nutrients. And in my view, therein lies kind of the foundational, the, the kind of the bedrock foundational basis for what is optimal for every living human being. And then on top of that, you can layer things that may add to that in some way and hopefully not take away, right? And I think that there are many fibrous vegetables and greens that have something to offer us because of the phytochemicals they contain. Now, not everybody tolerates them. People have oxalate problems or they have a nightshade problems or they have whatever. And um, okay, don't eat those foods. But again, if you can incorporate a certain amount of, of dietary diversity, taking in some phytochemical rich uh, plant-based foods that you tolerate well, I think you're most likely only enhancing the equation. You're not going to take away from it. Um, but but animal source foods of uncompromising quality and sourcing, you know, are foundational to every single one of us. I don't care who you are. We all share a common hunter-gatherer ancestry. And those principles are the only rational starting place any of us have when when, you know, trying to figure out you know, what is the optimal way to eat? Yeah. And again, I take and I cross pollinate that with longevity research and, you know, taking a look at the selective pressures that we're facing today, which I think are far more hostile and scary than anything our ancestors had to put up with. And, and trying to put that together in a way that gives us the best chance we have of optimizing our health or having any semblance of health, frankly, in today's world. And in reading through your your newer book compared to the other one, uh, yeah. you know, Primal Body, Primal Mind from 2009, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Originally, and then it was revamped and republished in a much better way in 2011. Yeah, okay. I always tell people go for the 2011 version. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm, in, I'm embarrassed by the 2009 version. But anyway, but, but in any case, um, you're not someone who's going from like. <laughs> I, I'm the face of carnivore and I'm the face of keto and I'm the face of paleo and I'm the face of whatever is, is it's like, you're not doing that at all. And also your message from what I've seen anyway, while you do make adjustments for all the education that, that you've had and all the learning that's, that's been done and all the new science and all of that, for the most part, I'm not seeing you like dart from idea to idea and change your stance on, on many things. At I all. don't care which way the wind is blowing. Yeah. You know, I'm an oak tree here, <laughs> you know, I'm going to stand my ground and say, look, I mean, I've seen, I have connected far too many dots, you know, and that's the thing that gives, you know, the, the what I talk about in terms of a kind of a foundational dietary um, scaffolding, if you will, or, or an architecture for, for optimizing health. 
you know, there's a lot of different stuff holding it up. It's not just, you know, one little pillar of, you know, this, you know, string of scientific studies or this string of who, who knows who paid for whatever scientific study. Um, I really, it, I have, it, uh, things have to make sense from a lot of different angles before I'm going to stand up and say, you know, this is a principle I'm willing to stand behind, mm -hmm. you know, I'm willing to put my name on and stand behind. And I, and I believe it will stand the test of time. You know, we're not talking about, about, you know, about fad related stuff here. And I, and I get a little dismayed when I see what's happening. I mean, look, this, it, it, it's going to happen to any idea that starts to take hold, right? right. Where, um, you know, an idea becomes popular and then industry moves in and attempts to co-opt it. And then, and then newcomers come into the mix and see a financial opportunity, an entrepreneurial opportunity, and they cut and paste from other people's work and make, get their marketing teams together and turn it into something that they think they can get out there in a bigger way. And it turns into something that really deservedly should be called a fad. And I see this happening with so much of what goes on in the so-called paleo movement and, and even the keto movement. For sure. I am all about a fat-based ketogenic approach to things, but it has to make sense from an ancestral perspective. It's right. got to be uncompromising and not based on a bunch of, you know, snack foods with cellophane wrap, you know, whatever cavemen stamped on the labels and, you know, and cookies and cream keto bars and things like that. I, I am just, I'm embarrassed by so much of what I see going on in all of that, you know, and it's frustrating to me because it takes away from what it, you know, from, from what is a foundationally incredibly sound concept, you know, series of concepts that I'm but trying you have to, to do the work. A, you right? do, you or do you have to be able to at least, you know, you know, right. You know, it, to think in, in, in these more foundational terms and just don't let yourself be seduced by every marketing effort out there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's not all bad, but it's, it's very confusing and confounding. And somebody says, well, I did the keto diet and it did this or that to me. It's like, well, what version of that was it? Because right. there is many different versions of paleo and as many different versions of keto as there are people claiming to practice them. And what I try to do is bring it back to its most sort of, uncompromising foundational substrate and 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 really try to optimize these these concepts in a way where you look you know you may think of that as rigid but look if you're going to if you if you reach for the stars you might hit the moon you know and i'm not going to tell people what they want to hear just so i can make a fast buck that oh it's okay just you know, just as long as you're doing what you should, what you should do 80% of the time, that's cool. Or everything in moderation or everybody's different. Don't get me freaking started on that. You know, nutritional politics. I'm sorry. I'm not a politician. No, you're you not. Know? And I'm thankful that you're not because we it, need you. We don't need more politicians right now. Right. You know, when somebody's telling you that, well, you just have to find what's right for you. Everyone wants to believe they're that special snowflake that is, you know, that is, I just know what's right for me. And, you know, and I do better with, you know, low fat, high carb, or I do better on vegan. Or I do. There is, <laughs> look, what defines us as a species is not our differences. It's those things that we share in common. And yes, there is a foundationally viable human diet. There is a human diet that is, that is absolutely required by every single one of us if we want to have any semblance of health at all. But I absolutely acknowledge such a thing as bioindividuality. And look, I spent more than 20 years in clinical practice, you know, better than most at ferreting out those nuances that, that, that define individual needs and restrictions. I'm really good at that. Um, but again, that's nuance that's layered, that it is meant to be layered on top of that foundational substrate. And if all you're focusing on is your bioindividual stuff, and you don't have those foundations intact, you will never get the results you're looking for uh, long term. There's just no possible way you can ever optimize your health. You'll forever chase. You'll be chasing after, you know, if effluvia, you know, and you'll be missing the point of your of your health altogether. Yeah. Um, and that's the problem, you know, that everyone wants to make it, you know. Well, I'm I'm not gonna quote quotes because it'll be obvious who I'm talking about, but um, you know. Look, we all have some individual needs, but the um, but we have to realize that 
again, what defines us as a species is what we have in common. And yeah, we may have individual unique fingerprints, but we all have fingers, right? And that's where we have to start. That's yeah. where we have to start. And so, um, anyway, yeah, I get a little worked up about some of this stuff because I, I, I just see way too much politicking going on. And unfortunately, they're playing off of what people want to hear. Right. You know? And it's tough. It's tough because you see a lot of people doing great work, but they're doing a whole lot of that, too. And mm -hmm. it's like the monster that we're all fighting is so much bigger than any of that stuff it so you is. don't want to bigger but at the same time these words are really important and if people are confused about what they mean keto it has been really that i was really surprised by how quickly that took off at a term and, and even the people who are like supposedly practicing it have no idea what it means and it's no, like I oh know. goodness me and now <laughs> let's it's... layer fasting on top of that and whatever and it's like <laughs> oh my god you know well you know so there's a validity in each of these concepts but sure. the problem is it's been taken over by so many you know, convoluted interests that it doesn't ultimately, you know, it, it, it's, it's more confusing and, and, uh, you know, than anything for people. Yeah. And, you know, so what I've done is, I mean, I've, I've found myself kind of struggling to fit myself like a square peg into a round hole I when I get up on, way, yeah. on the stage, you know, in, in these ancestral health conferences and things. And I find myself trying to explain, you know, why, you know, why what I'm talking about is a little different from what you might think. Yeah, just hold it down. You got to hold it down. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you so are. here's my way you of know? doing that. What I've done is I've, I've actually, I, mostly in a fit of peak and in a desire to, to, to claim some kind of control over my own terminology, I decided to create my own term for what I promote. And yeah. that term is primalgenic right? I've legally trademarked it so that it can never mean anything other than the meaning I give it. Right. And, and it really wasn't an effort at marketing, so to speak, because I don't think that way. I really don't think that way, which is, you know, if I did, I'd actually have some money. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, but I'm just, I'm passionate about safeguarding these concepts in a way yes. that, that cannot be taken over by, by all kinds of special interests that want to just capitalize on a fad, right? And so, you know, primalgenic, you know, I mean, they're, you know, I actually have a, uh, a free webinar. People can go to primalgenic.com and they can sign up and it'll explain what primalgenic is and how I came to that and what the, you know, 12 different pillars are that I, that kind of hold it all up. Yeah. You know, it's not just one or two things. It's really, I'm trying to create a really something that's going to stand the test of time. Right. And it's important to, to really define what those boundaries are and what the meaning of things that that's, what's been, I think the internet has ruined words for us. It's ruined the meaning of words. We can no longer have conversations about what things mean because everyone has a different definition for the same word. And that's more problematic than most people realize. So I, yeah, I, I totally get it. You coming up with your own term as a protective, like that's what I tried to do with the wild diet as well. It's like, I'm not trying to own wild. The whole point is that you can't <laughs> own wild, you know? <laughs> you are kind of a wild guy, but yeah. <laughs> Maybe, but it's like yeah. mostly in the, not in the sense that I want to trademark wild and sell wild supplements. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's no, like, no, but that concept means something. Yeah. I mean, totally. wild means something, right? It means something unadulterated by, by well, <laughs> mo modern industrialization in theory. Yeah. But even that word is polluted by girls gone wild and stuff like that too. And so it's like subliminal. Oh, this was another thing I wanted to talk to you about real quick. Cause we are running out of time, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. in some of the vegan documentaries and stuff like that, the subliminal like tricks that they're using. Like when I was watching some of these, cause everyone's just pestering and they're like, you got to watch game changers and you got to watch this. And I'm just like, okay, let's see what they're up to. And it's like, wow, this is kind of dark. It's, it, it's know? insidious. It's dark. It is look, it's, it's marketing people. Yeah. It is marketing. There are, there's a massive amount of money app. app. Look, I can't think of a single tr transnational corporate interest on planet earth that wouldn't be heavily invested and every man, woman, and child on this planet consuming an entirely carbohydrate-based diet, you know, um, because it, it's cheap and very easy to produce. It's almost immeasurably profitable. And I, I'm always using the example, right, that you can't make a 5,000% profit on a, on a grass-fed steak like you can a box of cereal. And anybody consuming a diet like that is going to be kept more or less perpetually hungry because what carbohydrates are for us metabolically is kindling, you know? And it, you know, and and I have I have well, and so I'll finish this analogy, and then I'll give you my if in case your audience isn't familiar with my wood stove analogy, it'll help you understand what this is about. But 
you know, th just think of who stands to profit from all of that, right? Of course, everybody immediately thinks Monsanto and yeah, or Bear as it is um, now. But you know, number one customer for big oil is big agribusiness. So there's that. There's the chemical industries producing all the pesticides, herbicides, all the chemicals being thrown onto agricultural lands. There's the phosphate mining industry, strip mining, you know, all all over the place, just mm -hmm. destroying the environment as a way of creating artificial fertilizer to, to keep those crops going, those monocrops going. Um, you know, there is the pharmaceutical industry that is profiting massively from metabolically based diseases and everything else coming from modern industrialized food supplies. Um, you know, blood sugar, uh, you know, drugs alone are $137 billion a year business. The less healthy we are, the more pharmaceutical companies profit, the more the medical industry profits, the more Jenny Craig profits, you know, and undertakers are making out pretty well too. So, um, and it's, it's, it just goes, the list goes on and on and on as to who's profiting, you know, the, the people not making out very well are the rest of us that are bought into this whole mainstream idea that the base of the human dietary pyramid is supposed to be something that we didn't consume until a few thousand years ago, really. And then the whole genetically modified nightmare that's, that's, you know, we're living on the, we're, I mean, pretty soon it's all going to be the Island of Dr. Moreau. Yeah. I and mean, they're figuring out how to genetically modify animals and fish and whatever else too. And, you know, this is, we we're seeing the end of an era of, of, um, of our species and it's, you know, in its in its current intended incarnation, you know, we're moving into transhumanism and everything else. You need to understand that, it, you know, back in 2013, the uh, Na uh, National Defense Authorization Act was signed into law that made it entirely legal for corporations and uh, and government interests, which are cor corporate interests, because we know that our political, our entire political landscape, I don't care what side of the fence you're on, I'm telling you, it's all owned by the same people that, you know, that it is perfectly legal for them to propagandize you in on the news and the media in any manner, shape or form they choose without you knowing it. And that was signed into law back in 2013, you know, um, and, um, you know, this is, uh, it, you know, it's 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 terrifying, really, because what I would we have loved is, to have been able to vote on that, wouldn't you? I didn't vote for that. <laughs> none of us, none of us would have voted for that, and that's just it. None of us have voted for a lot of what we're getting, yeah, and we're losing absurd. the ability to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so we have, you know, yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we have to we have to understand that the mainstream news. It's it's all, actually all of the mainstream media, uh, print, radio, and television media are owned by no more than six corporate interests. Now a lot and of podcasts of them, too, a lot of YouTube channels, a lot of podcasts, a lot of social media, and you don't know who's owned all of. All well, of them. and guess really what? Scary. And a lot of the ones that aren't owned by those interests now are actually being pulled, um, pulled basically. They're yeah. fa Facebook pages of people representing more, you know, independent interests and whatever else that are actually questioning some of those mainstream assumptions yeah. are getting pulled, being called fake news and taken down. You oh, yeah, we've, we've taken Facebook. some hits. We've taken that uh, ourselves. That, yeah. yeah. It, it, and and uh, so if you, do, if you aren't in lockstep with the mainstream narrative, your message is going to be at best completely sublimated or maybe taken away entirely. Yeah. You know, and we this needs we need to consider this completely terrifying, right? I think so. Uh, People don't realize how terrifying that is, and the idea that that I know which words I'm not allowed to say, and that I won't be able to upload to YouTube anymore if it's in the title, or or if I like mention that word right now, it's just we know that, I know what the word yeah. is. Yep. <laughs> there, are, it's not just one word though. It started yeah. with like one word, and now it's yeah. a whole list. It's a whole list of words. And uh, if you're not supposed to think about the white polar bear, good luck making it through the interview without thinking about the white polar bear the whole time. Right, exactly. We have to pick and choose our, our language very carefully or you're going to get taken down. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are uh, industry sock puppets that infiltrate people's Facebook pages and all this kind of a thing. I mean, a lot of trolls are actually for hire. You know, they Absolutely. go in there and intentionally foment. 
absolutely, you know, designed to do this. So you know? it's so great to to see you holding your ground. Um, and and That's what I do. very inspiring. <laughs> it's so important that you do because there's just aren't that many of us left in a lot of cases, you know, and and, and we need each other. But um, we do have a little bit more time. Um, and I just want to kind of have you raise the stakes about this, too, because a lot of people don't realize that they're already starting down the road of dementia and potentially Alzheimer's and other like things that could compromise their brains and lives. So maybe you can just speak to that for a little bit from a personal well, perspective. Right. Well, you know, the first thing I, I bring up with all of this is that we need to consider what the selective pressures were that shaped our unique human brain and its architecture in the first place. And if you still have a brain and you want to keep it, you have to start there. OK, I know there are all these little protocols and supplements and things that people have that they put together that can help. I'm telling you, unless you're dealing with this foundationally, you'll never you're, you're just not going to be able. Um, I mean, we're all at extremely high risk now of, you know, dementia, and Alzheimer's and all these things. Um, and, um, you know, we need to we need to pay close attention to what our brains are made of and what they require for their optimal functioning before we start layering all kinds of extra supplements on top of that, right? I'm not opposed to supplements. I actually think, I don't know how anybody gets by without some supplementation because frankly, what we need just isn't in our soils anymore even. You know, you can be eating totally organic food, but it just isn't going to have the same rich complement of nutrients that, you know, that may have been existed in their wild counterparts. and. Um, and, you know, for wild animals in, you know, the environment that, you know, that, that they, you know, have thrived in. So, you know, we have to take all this stuff into consideration. But look, I, you know, my, my mom is dying of advanced Alzheimer's disease now. And I'm, um, I have, I, in, in recent months, I've come into, at, at, at long last, in, in my view, the, um, the ability to be the one primarily overseeing her care. Unfortunately, you know, she's really in her end stages. But even so, even so, I've been able to go in and make radical changes to her diet. I mean, she was being fed just appalling things that I had no control over. It was yeah. very, very frustrating. And really now common gone, at end of life for... It for, is. Know. Oh, you know, they're dying. Just let them eat what they want. <sighs> you know, so it's not about quantity of life, right? It's about quality of life. I know I was on Dave Asprey's podcast, you know, and he's like, so I think I'm going to live 180 years. I don't remember what he said. How long are you going to live? And I said, I could get hit by a bus as soon as I walk out of here. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. What matters to me isn't how long I live. It's the quality of my life in that, yeah. you know, in, during whatever time I have. It is my ability to have my mobility and to have my cognitive functioning intact, my ability to recognize and appreciate all of the things that and people that have ever given my life meaning. That's what it's about. And so, you know, again, my mom probably isn't very long for this world, but in the time she has left, I want her to be able to experience happiness and to be able to interact in a meaningful way with people around her and have some semblance of meaning in her life. And she's getting that back right now. It's not reversing her disease, but it is giving her a window of humanity through which she can hopefully, that she can hopefully hang on to when she takes her last breath. And that's what matters. So, um, you know, she went from, you know, totally bedridden in a, you know, um, you know, a borderline vegetative state um, where she was just totally agitated and, you know, and, and occasionally combative and whatever else. And within a couple months, I had, you know, I was, I had caregivers sending me footage of her sitting at the kitchen table feeding herself. Wow. You know. You know, and looking looking good, and and sitting in front of the window, looking out over the ocean with her feet up on a chair, and taking that in in a way that she could appreciate. That's what it's about, right? And when I just went, I visited her a couple of weeks ago, and you know, she was able to recognize me. Wow, a lot of people. We just recently lost our our grandmother at you know she was in her late nineties and um similar thing though we went through it's always been a tough battle um once she you know wasn't really feeding herself as much anymore 
trying to fight off all the terrible things that they're trying to hand or the cakes and the cookies and the all just the, the glucose and the sucrose and the chemicals and all the stuff that that someone who's close to the end of life anyway just like can't handle anymore and there's there's going to be a steep drop off if you don't take extra care at that time and those just few last moments of lucid of, of clear thinking and being lucid are you know, I'm sure it's kind of like getting goosebumps right now just thinking about that because they're so important. Right. I mean, I I went in there with steel-toed boots and I I got rid of the people that were not taking care of her the way they were supposed to. And I um, created a whole new team and I put a team of a, a new medical team, fired the old medical team, put a new medical team together that were actually are actually really open to what I do and, and really embracing of that and uh, and willing to help. Uh, support and facilitate that. Um, and and look at my mom, not as a job to do or as just another, you know, patient number, whatever, but as a human being, you know, yeah. where there's there's caring and loving compassion and um, and just the desire to do whatever is possible to restore quality of life and dignity, you know, at, at you know, in these end stages. And, you know, it's, it's exhausting for me to do what I do, because, like I say, I mean, some days I made I've made ten calls and written ten emails or whatever on my mom's behalf before the sun has even come up, and most of my day right now is being eaten up by all of this. What's good about all that, though, is that number one, I, it's the privilege of being able to do this for my mom, you know, person that has known me longer than I've known me, right? And uh, to me, you know, I you know return you know, return a portion of the favor anyway. Um, but also what I'm learning from this goes way beyond what, it, you know, what the nutritional do's and don'ts are, what the, what the potential, you know, nutritional benefits are of, of, of you know, and, and supplements and whatever else in a certain way. I mean, I'm, I'm learning, you know, a lot about that even as I go, even, you know, with all I knew going in, you know, I, 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 got, I have such a rich new plethora of understanding that is just really making a difference. But I'm also learning about what it takes to care for someone that can't take care of themselves. And particularly from a distance, as is true of so many people, you know, like none of, you know, my siblings or I actually live where my mom lives, you know, p people, they retire in, you know, Florida and Arizona or whatever. And that's not, they're not necessarily living where the rest of the family is living. And and so you're having to trust a lot of people to, you know, be as interested in the welfare of your loved ones as you are. And it's really hard to do that. Yeah. But there are things that you can do. And I've, I've, I've figured it out, I think. I think I figured out some really, really helpful things in that, in that way. So at some point, I'm hoping to be able to, you know, provide that education as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not about, well, this certain protocol for, for Alzheimer's. Look, there's a lot we can do to prevent Alzheimer's way before it starts. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that there's an autoimmune component. We need to understand that there is a, you know, brain-based diabetes component. I mean, and we need to address things from that perspective. And yes, there are certain supplements that can enhance things and, you know, and certain things, um, certain medications, whatever, they're going to interfere with whatever progress you hope to make. And, and those are all important to know. But there is a very human side of all of this that is also really, really, really important to understand. And I'm, you know, I've just been shocked at the, how very few people actually understand that part of it. Yeah. So. And there's a tendency to dehumanize all, all of this somehow, which is so confusing. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of what happens like within families is people realize that loved one is on their way out. And oftentimes people, it's, it's a defense mechanism where they'll start to kind of separate themselves a little bit subconsciously. They're separating themselves out. They just, they can't deal maybe on some level or right. they just don't want to think about maybe because they're afraid of how it might end up for them or I don't know what. And because of the huge amount of work involved and because when you see the person that raised you that was this extraordinary person and they're a shell of what they were, you know, and, and they've just fallen apart in ways that are, you know, and the loss of dignity and the loss of you know, so much is just really hard to take, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you have the capacity for feeling, it's, it's a hard hit, you know, and so I get that, um, but it's, uh, 
you know, so we separate ourselves out. And I think too, caregiving um, and the kind of caregiving that that works with these populations, you know, um, the our most helpless and vulnerable uh, people, suffering people in the world, it is exhaustive work. Yeah. And these are the most poorly paid people on the planet. I mean, they make minimum wage for wiping someone else's ass all day long. Yeah. I mean, they have my total respect. I mean, these are Mother Teresa's doing this kind of work, but mm -hmm. it's it's a fast track to burnout for a lot of them. And after a while, it's just the person laying in front of them. It's you know, they're trying to raise their own families and you know feed their own kids and pay for daycare, whatever, on minimum wage, and mm -hmm. you know, and that person laying in front of them may be combative or you know. Um, uh, you know, or whatever else. And, you know, it's just another diaper change. It's just, you know, that person becomes a project and not a human being that may be frightened and confused and lonely and in need of meaningful human connection. Right. Yeah. So it, it's, it's doing things that bring that into the equation and um, that I find that, that have actually been my, my toughest challenge, but I've figured out ways of doing it and, and ways of safeguarding and, um, you know, potential conflicts of interest and, and things like that that sometimes enter into these types of, you know, caregiver agencies and things like that. Yeah. There, there are all kinds of things you can do. And, and um, so I'm learning a lot about that and I hope to be able to, to, to share that with people at some point because, you know, we're baby boomer. I mean, I'm in the baby boomer generation. We're all heading in that direction. Hopefully, I like to think I'm not going to suffer the same fate as my mom. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so many people I love and care about, you know, probably will uh, in this world. And, uh, you know, we need to, you know, we need to be prepared for that. Yeah. It's, it's overwhelming, the healthcare system now. Yeah. And our health is under attack and whether we're young, old, anywhere in between. And so it's more important than ever to put your shields up, practice dietary self-defense and, and defense over your own consciousness. This is, this is a battle that's uphill and, and it's right. not easy. And you know, this other thing I'm fond of saying that nobody in this world will ever care more about your health and well-being than you. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to develop an understanding about your health and well-being at a PhD level, but it is really important to take the steps to come to understand something about this machine that we inhabit, you know, and, and know how to nurture it in the best possible way. And the more that you understand, and I am all about giving people those tools so that they are armed and ready when they go into their doctor's office, they know how to ask intelligent questions. You know, they know how to, how to question certain things, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and, and also, you know, where it is that they may need to take responsibility for their own health in certain ways, rather than just simply turning it over and entrusting it to someone whose best interest may not lie with yours, but may instead lie with profit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We all have to safeguard our own best health and well-being. And we have to all learn to connect the right dots if we're going to do that. And it's not just if we're going to have some semblance, you know, be optimally healthy, much less have some semblance of health, but also, I mean, that's what's going to be necessary for us to survive as a species. Totally. Well, Nora, your work is so important. What's the best place to find you uh, and your books and, and all the other stuff that you're working on? Right, right. So, I mean, my books are all over Amazon. They're in bookstores. Uh, Primal Body, Primal Mind was my first one. Uh, I have a book called Rethinking Fatigue, What Your Adrenals Are Really Telling You and What You Can Do About It. Kind of brings the whole idea of adrenal fatigue and burnout into the light of the 21st century and dispels a bunch of myths and misconceptions around that. And then my most recent book, um, Primal Fat Burner, and that's published by Simon & Schuster. And that's widely available on Amazon and, and in bookstores and things like that as well. Um, I also teach some uh, courses. Uh, I have a 52-week certification course I call Primal Restoration. And I don't have a bad review from anybody that's been through that program. And I do every week. Um, I get on and I do a live Q&A with the students and whatever else. And a lot of them are practitioners of all different kinds. I mean, medical doctors, naturopaths, chiropractors, health coaches, net nutritionists, but also just, you know, lay people that are really interested in, 
in taking a deeper dive into all of this and being and, and learning what they need to know to better safeguard their own health and well-being. You know, everybody's welcome, you know, f- for that. And um uh and so um, I'm really proud of that program. I just released something called uh, what I call the Primalgenic Plan, a uh, three-week meal-by-meal meal total health transformation program. And it's based on all the concepts we've been talking about here, but it help, it's designed to help handhold people through the process of adopting this dietary approach. Uh, it helps people with goal setting, it helps people with overcoming sticking points and troubleshooting and over, you know, and also knowing how to sort out all the myths and misconceptions and, and, uh, and there's all just a whole host of other detailed information. I mean, one of the things that I'm, um, um, also kind of proud to say is that this is at least potentially the most affordable way to eat optimally well in existence. And there's information in the program that will help you, uh, you know, figure that out. Um, and um, this can actually be less expensive than the standard American diet, but there are tricks to that. There are tricks to knowing how, and look, if you're shopping at Whole Paycheck, you know, Whole Foods or whatever, you know, then yeah, you're just, it's going to be more expensive, but it doesn't need to be. And this is not a high, this is not the carnivore diet, by the way. And I have an article on my blog right now about the carnivore diet and my, and my beef with that, so to speak. I encourage people to look at that because this is not necessarily a high meat, you know, diet. Mm -hmm. It is, it is definitely based on animal source foods, but um, it, it moderates protein intake for reasons that, you know, you'll learn about. Um, there are very good reasons to, to think about it that way. And so the Primalgenic Plan is probably my single most requested program to date. And um, everybody that is, uh, I mean, I'm getting, I'm actually really almost surprised at, at the feedback I'm getting. It's just so overwhelmingly positive and people are just really experiencing some wonderful you know, wonderful, wonderful things as a result of that. And so it's really already starting to pour in. But anyway, I encourage people to check it out. That's primalgenic.com. My blog is at primalbody-primalmind.com and a bunch of other, you know, information. And um, and if you're interested in my other stuff, primalcourses.com, you know, for my certification program and all of that. So I got some stuff going, but yeah, it keeps me busy. <laughs> it keeps me out of a, a little bit out of trouble. Anyway. Something like that. Um, any of you who, who haven't explored Nora's work, um, and I don't say this very often, but she is the real deal. Please <laughs> dive in, go into it, read the books, help support her. Nora, I wish I could clone you a thousand times. Oh, man. Well, I'm a Gemini, so you got at least two of me going. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks once again for taking the time. You're welcome. I'm, I'm going to have to do this much more often. I would love to have you back. I, I would love to. Yeah, I completely adore you, and I, and I greatly respect what you do. Oh, um, you're, one of the, you're really, truly one of the good ones, and, and really one of the few good ones. Thank you for saying that, and thanks for coming on. Hey again, this is Abel, and thanks so much for hanging around till the end of this episode. As promised, here's a little piece that I put together on piano, just made it up on on the spot, um, admittedly on a Saturday morning, a little bit hungover, but I find that music can really, especially when I'm feeling strung out or, or I could use a bit of a lift, playing music helps prop me up and I hope it gives you a little bit of a boost too. So here it is. Uh, if you're watching the video, you'll know why I called it the fluffy rope song. Here we go.
Well, hey there, friend. This is Abel. Long time no see. I have a couple of quick things. Number one, thank you so much to those of you who have checked in on us. So far, so good up here in the mountains. My wife, Allison, and I are here with the dog. Things are going well. We're working hard, cooking a lot. And also, I have another quick announcement. We just started up virtual one-on-one -on -one coaching. I already have some international clients, and I'm uh, coaching some small businesses as well. And also, if you'd just like to tip us a few bucks or join the group coaching club, the coffee club, then check out our brand new Patreon channel. Look up Able James on Patreon, or you can also go to fatburningman.com slash tip jar and find it there. And I'm giving away for a limited time my brand new international best-selling book, Designer Babies Still Get Scabies. You can download the ebook and my audio book for free as part of your subscription to our new Patreon channel, where you can get our content uncensored, episodes of the show, you can get uh, some of my music that's coming out, some live shows that I've never released before, as well as you can ask me questions, get in touch one-on-one. -on -one. And I love connecting with you. So once again, look me up, Abel James, on our brand new Patreon channel, or you can also go to fatburningman.com slash tip jar. And those of you who haven't checked out the book yet, then go to designerbabiesbook.com and take a peek. It might give you some giggles and help you survive this apocalypse and dystopian world that we find ourselves in. So once again, thanks to those of you for connecting. Drop a line anytime and we'll be in touch. This is Abel out. Well, hey there, listener. This is Abel one more time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of The Fat-Burning Man Show. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you might be listening to or watching this show right now. And if you have a second, please leave me a quick review for The Fat-Burning Man Show. I read every single one of them, and every time you leave a review, it gives us a little boost in the rankings, and that helps other people find this show. And if you can think of someone else who might enjoy and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or a family member. And if they're like, what is this fat burning man thing? That's a really silly name. You could be like, you're right, but here's the deal. We've recorded over 250 episodes of the fat burning man show with thought leaders in health from all over the world. And so far, We've won four awards, hitting number one in health in more than eight countries internationally. We have more than 30 million downloads already, but we're just getting started. I can't believe any of this, by the way, and, and couldn't do any of this without you. So thanks once again. But here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode of the Fat Burning Man Show for free with zero outside advertisements, no outside sponsors, and no corporate overlords. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. We'll give you a, a second here just to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes, transcripts, and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show for free. Better yet, enter your email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide so you can take your health into your own hands right now, along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free goodies with a bonus surprise straight to your inbox. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening once again and have a great week.